I mean, just looking at like the most sort of sad people in the world that are doing this, it, it was just, it was not the side of the industry that inspires. So you just finished teaching a year of eighth grade drama at the John Burroughs School. Uh, you make the decision with, I think, like 150 bucks to your name to leave St. Louis, drive your 86 Toyota Corolla cross country to LA. Um, at that point, um, what are you hoping for how it'll work out? I remember being, I remember being a, a little, like pretty terrified but also excited. I was 25 years old. I mean, you're still kind of bulletproof then. Uh, by this point, I'd, I'd lost my dad when I was 20. And, and so I was kind of like, well, it's kind of a clean slate. Like, why not go to LA? Why not go west, young man, see what's out there? I had an aunt, I had family, and I had several friends. And I thought, okay, I. I I bet this is manageable, at the very least. I knew I could wait tables anywhere in the world. I'm a good enough bartender and waiter, and speak a little Spanish, like I'm fine. So I, I knew I could, I could land on my feet and, and figure it out. Around this time, you had, a, I think, a variety of jobs, one of which, as you've spoken about before, uh, you worked briefly on a softcore porn yeah, set. Yeah, that was, uh, that was my, uh, my friend, Cappy Kilburn, who was our college stage manager. Right. I had a group of friends that lived out here that were from college. And we were all sitting around commiserating one night, just like, you know, none of us had jobs. And we were just like, what are we, we're eating, you know, a big bowl of pasta that we all chipped in to make or whatever. And, and uh, I was probably 26, been out here a year. I was like, I need a job, man. I, 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 catering isn't working out. I'm like, no. She goes, you can have my job. I, I'm sick of it. I can't, I can't deal with it anymore. I was like, what's your job? She's like, set dressing. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know how to do that. Like, isn't that a thing that you need a skill set? And somebody, she goes, no, <laughs> you don't. And certainly not for this. I was like, oh, I'm not in the union. Like, is this? She goes, no, 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 no. And she's got like a bucket of tools. She goes, here, take this, show up at seven o'clock in the morning. It's this warehouse in downtown LA. And I was like, this, that's, this is the shadiest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was, and I worked there for like a month. Why was it weeks. depressing? Well, why do you think? I mean, you're just looking at like the most sort of sad people in the world that are doing this. It, it was just, it was just a bummer. Like, you know, it's just like, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was not the side of the industry that inspires. How did not getting an acting job for three years impact your confidence? You have to have a pretty thick skin to, to do anything in this business. And you have to kind of understand that, that, there's some, that there's a rhyme or reason sometimes, sometimes, and then sometimes you just get blind lucky. Uh, and I had had, you know, I had, I'd never got, I, had, didn't, I wasn't working, but I was auditioning, like a million auditions, and I kept getting called back. Like, the idea of somebody saying like, oh, I like you, might not be for this thing, but you know, there's, there's going to be another thing. And so I had that kind of feedback from casting directors and producers and directors and, and people like that. And I was like, okay. And I auditioned for like a lot of cool stuff, like uh, Steven Spielberg. Like, uh, well, you know. What do you remember from meeting with him? Well, I, I didn't meet him. Okay. I met his, the woman who directed the film that he was producing, which is called Deep Impact. And I didn't get the job. John Favreau did. But, you know, you, you, you have to find the, the, the positive to pull away from from whatever rejection you, you have, or you're, or you're just gonna spiral. But I was able to kind of, for, for whatever reason, able to kind of understand that there was, there was positives to be taken from it. Explain how signing a contract right before the final audition ended up messing with your head. Oh, it's, well, it's, testing for a pilot, especially for a network pilot, is, is, a, is such a mind f because they just, you're, you're in a, a, a space, this size, with all the other people that they're considering hiring other than you. And it's kind of like a feeding friend is go, and you have to go in and do your thing, and they, they, they make you sign your contract before you go in because they basically, when they're making the decision on who to hire, they're going, this guy costs this, this guy costs this, this guy costs this. And that way they maintain all the leverage. You can't say like, oh, they want me, so guess what, I'm gonna charge double the rate. 
So it's all buttoned up before you go in there, and you think, if I get this job, I'm gonna make more money than I've ever seen in my life. All, all my bills are gonna be paid. I'm gonna be able to pay my back rent. I'm gonna be able to go Christmas shopping. I'm gonna be able to, you know, which is the last thing you wanna be thinking about before you go in and try to make people believe that you're an alien doctor or something, you know what I mean? So, But it would creep into your head. Oh, of course. It, it, I, I, everybody will tell you, everybody will tell you that, that auditioning is, is, it's the worst. Steve, I remember reading Steve Martin's book, and he was like, the day I, I was able to stop auditioning was like the greatest day of my life as a performer because it's just, it's, it's so unnatural and, and awful, and yet it's the only thing we got.